This meeting is being recorded. Hello and welcome to The Gaggle, where we challenge and, if necessary, destroy media narratives. I'm George Samueli. With me today, of course, is co-founder of The Gaggle, Peter Lavelle. And we're very honored today to have a special guest, um, somebody who needs no introduction to gagglers. In fact, there's been a vociferous demand among gagglers that you know, we want Matt Errett. So we finally <laughs> delivered Matt Errett, and I hope everyone will be happy. Matt Errett is a, a blogger, an author, um, is a, a, a regular a commentator on um, international affairs. And obviously there's a great deal to discuss. Um, one thing we could um, start off with is obviously the, the, the big news of last week was the um, Seymour Hirsch story and um, his essentially confirmation of what we had suspected all along was that um, the author of the uh, explosion on the Nord Stream gas pipelines was the United States. Um, well, what's interesting about this, um, I mean, there are two interesting things about it. First of all, that this act of terrorism, but that's exactly what it is, um, was really perpetrated um, against an ally. The United States did this against an ally. It didn't do it against an adversary. It didn't do it against Russia. It did it against Germany, its closest ally in, in Europe. The second thing is um, the United States is now putting down a marker and saying, this is how we are going to deal with economic challenges around the world. You know, yeah, you, you think you're going to get around um, our naval dominance. You know, you, we, we can choke, uh, close off the various choke points in the world, you know, so that we can, that, that was used to be our dominance. And you're going to get around it by building pipelines, you know, underwater and under sea. No, you're not going to do it. We are going to uh, sabotage any attempt to, to get outside of the American uh, power uh, stream. So anyway, I thought that might be an opportunity yeah. to, to kick off. So what's your take? Yeah, what a what a shit show. Eh? I mean, it, it's really late stage empire cannibalizing itself yeah. Um, yeah. entirely. And I mean, just the very fact that the, the, this was something which these figures like Victoria Newland and Blinken and, and others were were relishing so openly. And even before it happened, you had such such remarks from from Newland and, and Biden himself asserting that this would never happen. It's it's really just the this egotism, this hubris of of over self confidence, which gives me, and I I think many of the intelligentsia of the of the Eurasian partnership as well as the saner people around the world a little bit of a sense of hope that uh, ultimately behind this military power, this the levels and layers and nests of conspiracy, which seem all very intimidating and, and sophisticated, there is this deep. Um, drunkenness this uh, this this tendency to just drink your own um opium right or, or smoke your own opium to, to do your own drugs which you originally catered for victimizing your masses they're doing it themselves and they're they're selected managers of the system that they need to navigate through the storm are themselves nuts and seymour hirsch i was a little bit worried because he didn't do anything for a few years and i was like dad did he retire did he go off the grid, what happened? And then to come out the way he did the, with this bombshell of a report, which is causing such reverberations, uh, is it, fantastic. I mean, this guy has sources, contacts out of the wazoo, and he just put it together in such a beautiful, horrifying, horrifyingly beautiful fashion um, that, yes, I, indisputably, the U.S., managed it they they he goes through exactly how it was done how the detonators that were that were set up three months in advance were put there how the um or no how, how the mines were were put there on the on the pipeline how the detonators were, were oh were but matt in. you know he just he just made it all up matt okay <laughs> he, out of whole cloth he made it all up okay because that's the reaction to it i mean uh, the i think craig murray uh, has an article right now at uh, consortiumnews.com and and really talks about how the, the perfection of the big lie and you're absolutely right when you drink your own kool-aid here that would and, and george one of the things uh, i took from this whole story of course none of us had any doubts who was behind it i mean okay the details oh okay the norwegians played a role okay we knew we, you know that added a layer right there but kind of to the george's point this this hubris is that that you talk publicly about what you're going to do knowing the consequences of it and, and having such contempt 
for your, 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 your wonderful, wonderful allies. You know, we're doing it all for you after all, okay? We're again, crossing the pond to save you people from yourselves. And Victoria Newland and her public pronouncement, it's, it's so base, it is, it, it's really quite extraordinary. And it is end of empire panic. Because as George pointed out, you know, you know, I thought it was rule based rules based order replacing the UN Charter. Okay, no, it's called barbarism. That's what it is. Okay, and as George and I reflected upon uh, even before the Hearst report, is that now civilian um, infrastructure is on the table. Okay, so. Um, I fully expect uh, that on Russia's own timetable in place of its choosing, he, it will do something of its own, okay? Because what they've done is they've opened the gates to hell where anything is, is um, allowed. And the, the vulnerability, look, the American public and political class went bonkers over a balloon, okay? How do you think they're going to react to something that is actually meaningful? Mm, good point. Yeah, very good point. No, I, I mean they're uh, they're they're in such a state of hectic franticness, um, and I, I, I mean, you could see the signs. The cracks are all over the place, right? Where they they're all based on perception. This is an empire of perception, not reality. So that that again, it it demoralizes and intimidates certain people who are opening up or beginning to try to figure out how do you think about living under empire for the first time. This is obviously a big learning curve the last couple of years for a lot of people around the West. And, and at first it is intimidating, but I mean, when you look at it, they, they're, they're so inconsistent with themselves. The point that you even have finance ministers of Europe um, all arguing over uh, whether they should even start utilizing the, the Russian assets that they confiscated, they froze and essentially stole. They want to actually use, which, you know, now you're having weird debates like, is this against international law? I think it is, but we should, should we not do it any? By the way, where but is I, it? But and apparently, they according, to, <laughs> according to a Bloomberg story, they're not yeah. even sure where these assets are. So they say, yeah, we've got $500 billion of <laughs> Russian assets, but they said, we can only account for about 60 billion. We don't know where the hell the, the other assets are. Well, and, that's and, an interesting one. I hadn't even thought of that. You know, yeah, well, we've got it, but where are okay, they? Add to that, George, add to that, is that you have these um, uh, uh, Russian billionaires uh, which, much to my chagrin, taking the money out of Russia and, and, and putting it into the West, which, of course, the West is more than happy to clean their money because they take a profit from it. But Matt and George, how many yachts? I don't know the number off the top of my head, but they're actually servicing yachts in the Mediterranean because they've taken it away from their owners and they're just sitting in harbor and they're paying maintenance fees on it. Millions and millions of dollars, okay? So I would actually say this whole asset grab is a net loss for them so far, okay? And then you have Peter Avin, which of course um, I knew him when I worked at Alpha Bank. Um, you know, he has, I think, Lithuanian um, citizenship because of his ancestors, and now he, his assets now are on uh, on the line. Um, and he legally has uh, a, a citizenship in a Baltic uh, uh, state, but um, they're using that to go after his assets. Why? Because he was a banker in Russia. Okay, I mean, you know, it, it doesn't make any sense on this side of the, of the border, but it shows the mindlessness of it all. And and Matt is something that I've talked at great length on my program, is that you know the world is watching all of this. So why would anybody in the emerging world want to get near these people? They're just going to steal your assets. Okay, the yeah. the, the impact of that is so profound. Be, Saudi Arabia. Wanting to get into BRICS, for example, okay, they they see, you know, and I'm not, George and I are no uh, boosters for Saudi Arabia, but they they you know they realize that you when you when you get in bed with these people, it's treachery. Yeah, no, that's a great point. I mean, just the the lack of insight, eh? Like they need allies at this point. They need to. Africa is the future at this point. Like they're, they're you're going to have the dominant consumer market coming out by 2060 of Africa, like something like. 60% of Africans are under the age of 28 years old. I mean, yeah. this is this is the dominant, they, they're they hungry for growth, for technological development that they've been with, it's been withheld from the whole continent for generations now by a system of enduring empire. And they desperately want a better way. They look at what China did in 30 years, at compressing 300 years of Western experience of industrialization, China did in 30 years, and China, unlike the West, is providing the means for them to do it as well. It's happening at a slower pace, obviously. There's a lot more complexity and infiltration in fifth colonists 
and governments just wholly, you know, managed by Western corporations in, the, in Africa. But despite that, you have this giant hunger and thirst for a future. And with all of the, the offers for stability, for, for stabilization, for infrastructure, you have a military uh, uh, exercise that's going to be done with South Africa, China, and Russia this week. Um, you, despite that, Blinken and the, the Western you know, uh, managers are are still so delusional that they have these absurd festivities like the U.S. Africa Congress in uh, December 2022, which was just an imperialist wet dream trying to intimidate uh, these countries to signing over their their what little sovereignty they have to corporations to basically steal more of their their minerals for solar panel and green new deals. And I mean, they're playing, some of the governments are playing along and giving lip service, but obviously their hearts and minds and policies are completely, are going east, all of them. I mean, there's, there's, I don't know, there's something like 13 different governments that have sign, signed up to varying degrees with uh, African governments uh, with, with contracts to develop nuclear power with Russia. A um, couple are very, very advanced, South Africa, Egypt, Algeria, but I mean, even Sub-Saharan, there's a lot, which is, I mean, something that scares the hell out of a lot of Western geopoliticians because these countries are, Black Africa was never supposed to have nuclear power. That was only for South Africa. That's why they're, South Africa is the only country of Africa with nuclear because they were run by white racists for a long time. And now all of a sudden, the, the, the dark skinned people want to access and understand the atom and use it for their benefit. And, but, and yeah. Russia and China are helping. Yeah, but Matt, not- this, is, this is where it gets interesting. I mean, how does the U.S. respond to this? And one way that they could respond is how they responded to Nord Stream. They saw Nord Stream as a serious problem. Ever since they built Nord Stream 1, Americans saw this as a problem. Um, and, and the moment they started building Nord Stream 2, the Americans focused on it, you know, laser-like. This wasn't something, it didn't start under Trump. It started long before uh, Trump. They really, really hated this idea of this uh, en- energy uh, connection between Germany and uh, and Russia. And the American response was that, how are we going to stop this? You know, we're not going to stop it by sanctions. We're just going to physically stop it. That, 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 we're just going to blow it up. So, so this is how they're going to be dealing. I mean, we know we have all these Russia-Iran uh, trade deals, you know, this North-South uh, corridor. I think Americans are going to try just physically, they're going to try and destroy it. You know, any pipelines, you know, pipelines between uh, Russia and China, they're just going to physically try to destroy it, you know, just simply sabotage it, um, just as they did with Nord Stream. So, so well, I think well, that- well, George, but that begs the question is that, um, you know, w- w- we're in uncharted waters right now, the, the destruction of the Nord Stream pipeline. And as I said, there is going to be a reaction. So, I mean, I, I know the learning curve of the people in Washington is really flat, but um, you know, American infrastructure is very vulnerable, extremely vulnerable. Well, I mean, I think, I think yeah, no, I agree. I and and you know, and we, in all these cases of um, what do they call it when they um, um, uh, attack you, um, your your uh, security system? There's a certain t- word for it. It's it, it, work for, uh, cyber. Yeah, well, it, it's 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 a form of blackmail, but it's a, it, it's a kind of a oh, spinoff. Um, oh. Ransomware. Or, yeah, uh, ransomware. Like there you go. Yeah. Ransomware. Yeah. I mean, they're going to learn the hard way, and so that's what, what that's the, the very basis of deterrence. I mean, we usually think of deterrence when it comes to the nuclear triad, but maybe that's going to have to be expanded out because you know the, the uh, cables under the Atlantic Ocean and and things like that. I mean, are extremely vulnerable. The Atlantic is a big place, okay, and and and. The, the the Russians do have the technology here. Again, the 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 the, the Russians show enormous amounts of patience. And, you know, they always have this caricature of Khrushchev with a shoe. You know, but it it is not that is not the case right now. And so, but I think, but George does bring up a good point. The world is going to have to be very very worried um, that if they get out of line, that you know, it's not going to be just the the banking system and sanctions. It's going to be your territorial integrity. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, <clears throat> as you as you just pointed out, that Russia, the, the patience expressed by not only Russia, I mean, Iran, uh, China, so many of these countries, the, the patience is superhuman. And I mean, I think it, it begets a, a very deep insight on the part of the, 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 the geopolitical planners, the intelligentsia of these countries who have come to recognize a, an important point of principle, which is that the, the empire 
much like the Roman Empire earlier, except the Roman Empire was not sitting on as much, you know, the higher they are, the harder they fall. There wasn't as much technological advancement, as much, you know, economic integration, technological integration back 2000 years ago. But despite that, it collapsed under the, the weight of its own immorality, its own spreading itself too thin. So I, in part of it is that we have a condensed form of the collapse of the Roman Empire temporally. And they know psychologically what we talked about already just now uh, is that the this, this system is going to collapse under the under its own contradictions that have built up. It's like a bad mathematical equation. When you fudge the data early on in the when you're balancing the equation, if you if you don't correct that fudge early on, that'll get really big and loud the more layers of fudging you try to do. And then it's just a mess. Um, any mathematician knows you don't you don't skip those well, steps. That's an interesting point because you know it's it, it, I look at you know things like the 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 growing levels of debt in the West, which are really quite horrific. And you know in the and like the Roman Empire, I don't think the element of technology really is uh, all that germane. I think I think value system no longer believing in in um, uh, the ideology of empire. Um, I, I, I think countries like China and, and Russia, even India, um, um, South Africa, other, they're waiting for the U.S. For, for, for its own collapse. No one is going to attack the United States. There's, they, there's, the United States has no uh, real peer um, threat against it right now, but it, 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 it's, it, it is imploding on its own. It's attacking its own citizens. Um, uh, Alistair Crook uh, a couple days ago had a very interesting article about that, about how a divided America will play into the end of empire. And, and so I think it's the more the, I don't like to use Marxist language too much, but you know, the internal contradictions are coming into play. But that, what's, that's what makes the US a very dangerous country because Nord Stream 2, it's as good as start uh, acting in a most erratic way. John Mearsheimer in a recent debate, I think he, he was in, um, uh, Sweden or something like that. And I, I was really surprised in, in the audience was too. He said, look, the United States is Godzilla on, on, on the world stage, okay? And nobody wants to fight Godzilla, but maybe collectively they can start you know, um, uh, coming together and start uh, taming um, this uh, out of control power because they, you know, this, the fact that the, the, the uh, global majority, as I call it, are not on board for this at all. And, and, the, and, and the contradictions inside of Europe that are growing too, makes this a very, very dangerous time because it has been billed as the Second World War, Zelensky is, um, is Churchill. I mean, the, the, the rhetorical propaganda that is being spewed out right now is making it existential for them. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Well, you know, it, it, this is uh, we 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 are in a situation where th th there there is a matter of just allowing your enemy to fumble. Like it, the the nature of the enemy of I shouldn't call it the enemy because I, I ultimately live in the West and I want the West to rehabilitate and go back to its yeah. its, its better traditions that it, it once had. But all that to say, the the West is really. Um, it's flailing. It's a flailing beast right now. There's a lot of panic. And I, I think that the the Eurasian powers, a lot of the, the weaker states, as you pointed out, who are all vectoring east across the Southwest Asia and others, have come to recognize that this system is not long for the world. The financial system that, it, that the West is sitting on, the Wall Street City of London banking cartel, is a giant bubble waiting to blow. It is blowing. The ch supply chains are, are melting down, are being ripped to shreds part of it by design. And I think they're, they're kind of aware that there is this sort of intentional self-sabotage because originally you've got to keep in mind the, the 1992 script for the new world order that was being championed by, by Kissinger and Bush senior and, and Biden, how I learned to, to love the new world order. Right. This was all premised on the idea that the game was over. History was done. End of history is now. And now it's just pulling together the pieces. That's the new, the script worked. It's it's we're here. We're, we're at the end of the line. And um, and now all of a sudden for the past decade, especially, I mean, a little longer, but I mean, really the last decade, it's been dramatic. The script no longer functions when applied to reality. Reality doesn't behave, but they're still holding on to that same damn script. And so part of that involved, you know, getting over nation states, consolidating a one world League of Nations type of uh, technocratic government onto the world as the, the new type of governing class would impose their will from an Achean standpoint onto the, the, the many, you know, so-called regional powers of the world who wouldn't really have a say in anything very important. 
they could control local things. You know, they'd be granted local influence here and there with local managers, but ultimately they wouldn't have a say over anything while the system was shut down under this new feudalist sort of model of organizing society around human talking cows and masters, you know, untouchable immortals in their high castles and Davos and other other orgy infested zones of, of hedonism. That didn't work. That's not working anymore, you know? So they're, they're still operating on that script that they can't let go of. And all of these other countries are saying, China's saying, no, we don't want to sacrifice our people. Russia's saying, we don't want to sacrifice our traditions or people on this altar. Um, we're going to do something else, actually. And we're inviting you to join us, too. If, if there's anybody sane on that side of the, the wall, come and join us. And, and some people heard it. And they're, they're real at Saudi Arabia and, and UAE and Turkey and many countries who have behaved very badly are all saying, well, yeah, maybe that other side of the, maybe, yeah, maybe that's actually a little bit more in conformity with what we want, despite our, our proclivities to playing, <laughs> to playing so, a very yeah, nefarious no, game. But I think that's very interesting yeah. because um, you, you think, why didn't it work? You know, Fukuyama writes his book, The End of mm. History, which means, hey, the West has won the ideological wars, you defeated fascism, defeated communism, that's it, we're, we're going to dominate. And although, you know, Fukuyama would say, yeah, well, it'll be China, you know, that's a potentially big economic power. They essentially thought China would follow the trajectory of Japan, you know, and just simply accept American, uh, you know, subordination to the United States. They thought the, the kind of Yeltsin Russia, you know, Russia would always be under some Yeltsin-like figure, would also accept uh, rule by the United States. So essentially, neither Russia nor China played along with that script. So yeah. now, yeah, as you say, you, they have a problem and, and I think that's kind of where, why they decided to make a stand in Ukraine. <laughs> they, they, this is where you have to stop this. Uh, otherwise, this is really going to spin out of control. Just, just to, on, on uh, just the tail end of that, I think George is on to something here, because I the, the framing of the conflict in Ukraine, and it also touches on something that Matt, uh, Matt said, is that they, they, they think this is kind of the cure-all and the correction, the correction for all of the flailing, because the last 30 years have been a, a catastrophe. I mean, absolute catastrophe, particularly for the people they represent, for the middle class and working people. And they turn this into the silver bullet for the reasons both of you just mentioned here. And again, that's why I think it's really dangerous because it's not going to work. Yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> no, I know. I, I mean, it's um, it does seem like they they put all of their eggs in this damn Ukraine yeah. basket. Right? Like I, I thought at first that they maybe had. When I mean, obviously they're they're not ignoring other parts of the great game. You know, there's there's the there's there's obviously like like Lavrov said, Moldova. That's another component of what the calculus is thinking about. But what, what is Moldova? I mean, compared to Ukraine, that's like. The biggest bombshell that they had planted under Russia's underbelly was was Ukraine. Moldova is as a it can be problematic, as can Kosovo, which they're obviously like stirring the pot in various places to create disequilibrium. But I mean, they really put their 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 eggs in the Ukraine basket. That's that's the that's the real bomb right. that they but, didn't. But that Kosovo they and decades ago. Sorry, but Kosovo and Moldova are kind of they're part of the same problem. I mean, it's just opening yeah. up another front against Russia. I mean, you know, if, if things go bad in Moldova, Russia will have to do something. I mean, they can't just allow the, that enclave just to be overrun by uh, NATO. So, you know, that's yeah. going to be a problem. I mean, if, if, if they if this spins out uh, according to the um, the US NATO script, uh, Kosovo, that's that's they can't do much about that. And, you know, the loss of Serbia and Bosnia Herzegovina, that would be a problem for Russia. Um, but you know, but it's still it's part of the same game, which is let's yeah. create create problems for Russia. It's you know another front for Russia. But that's so mm -hmm. interesting, George. And and I mean again, you know the, the, the way it's it's it described to Western publics, you know that Transnistria, Moldova, okay, obviously Kosovo. There's nothing very little that can be done. But these are these are. Um, 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 uh, these are points to uh, for advantage that you push. You don't solve these problems. See, if you had a, you went to the approach of the, why don't we just solve this? Okay, I mean, who are the uh, uh, stakeholders? What do we, everybody want? How can we make this work for? It? But no, it's just the opposite. It's almost like oh, let's pull out the Transnistria card right now. It's time to play it. Okay, Moldova got one in my back pocket. We'll right. play it when we need it. See, right. yeah. this is this kind of mantic. Um, 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 mantic desire to cause trouble. I always have said this when, when it was going with all the stuff that was going on in Syria. I look at it as like 
a roulette wheel. They keep spinning the wheel, throwing the ball on, waiting for their lucky number. I didn't get it. We'll do it again. And we'll until it all lines up. Meanwhile, the people on the ground suffer. People go into debt. Okay. People's lives are destroyed. Puppets uh, are captured. All the while, they keep spinning the roulette wheel yeah. for a win. Oh, that's a great way to put it. Yeah, no, and it really is just a game of destruction. Uh, you're you're totally right. They don't care about collateral damage at all, and uh, just the 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 fact that all of their their so called allies and and there's a statement right that uh, I think it was Lord Palmerston who said the the empire doesn't have permanent friends. We just have permanent interests, mm -hmm. and that's really the same thing we see applied today. Is that all of the people who have been petted since World War II and petted and, and, and told that that they're the 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 treasured ally of the anglo-american special relationshipers um no everybody's a sacrifice sacrificial lamb on this on this game and uh whether it's japan whether it's i mean japan's being flushed there was a there's a direct war against the japanese people over the viability of of japan as an industrial civilization we could see it for the past especially 25 years really under reagan it began sabotaging china uh japan's uh, microchip industry by u.s competitors who undercut and undermined japan's once dominant uh microchip industry that was intentionally you know undermined princes of yen another great documentary by richard Werner. Uh, my wife wrote about this, but I mean, you know, they, they, there was a conscious desire to impose shock therapy and destroy, restructure the Japanese economy to make them more economically dependent upon the West. Same thing for South Korea, another occupied military industrial state. Never, never, the, the Korean War never ended in that sense, just like Japan, just like Germany, 40,000 troops still occupying Germany. And they'll, they'll be used on the chessboard, but ultimately flushed at the, the most expedient moment, like we see in Ukraine, like you think that what they're doing to Ukraine, 300,000 plus young you know, people, young men of Ukraine dead unnecessarily over a war that could have been stopped at any moment, and just by having a dialogue, which is now illegal in Ukraine to even just talk to Russian counterparts is illegal. Um, no, I mean, they, they're, they're, gonna do, they're willing to do this to the French, to the Germans, to anybody. They don't care. They're willing to do it to Americans. They're willing to do it to British people too. They don't because they're not nation state. It's not any nation in a in the 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 position of deciding anything. That's a that's a fiction we've been given by the mainstream media. Oh yeah, and, and if and if you try it, like uh, Hungary, there's punishment. Okay, you know if the you know Urban, uh, Urban says you know well oh, that's not you know it's not our fight here. Look what they do to him. I mean, I, I, George is obviously much more close uh, to it than we are, but I wouldn't be surprised if there's a colored revolution in play. Samantha that. Power. Samantha, Samantha Power, Powers, right, right is there the, right now on the ground. That's right. It was over the weekend meeting brilliant, talented young Hungarians. And you see these fresh faced um, Hungarians sitting at a table with uh, Samantha Power. You know, that's you know, the, the new elite that's being groomed by uh, the, the United States. But, but I guess, you know, going back to this point, I mean, the, the Americans really, they, they are afraid as, as it, for all the reasons that we discussed, the, the uh, you know, a kind of a rearrangement of the, uh, the geopolitical chessboard. They want to go back to the world in 1992. Um, that's why they're making a stand uh, in Ukraine. I mean, they're going to basically just keep doing this. I mean, they, they, they are determined to knock out Russia. Russia is the one they want to get it because if they, they, I think they think if we can knock out Russia, we're going to be able to deal with China. You know, China, China without Russia is an easy mark. You know, they, they don't have the sophistication uh, of Russia. They're more economically dependent on the rest of the world than Russia is. We can, you know, if we can knock out Russia, we can basically deal with China and treat China the way we dealt with Japan um, after 1945. I mean, that's, I think, the, the thinking in Washington, which is why they've, yeah. they, they've decided to target Russia first rather than China. But it, oh, yeah. unfortunately, it's not working. Okay, that's why I find it very interesting, Matt. Uh, I'm sure you followed it as well as they have these Ukraine contact groups, you know, reconstruction and, you know, uh, uh, who's going to uh, invest money in Ukraine and it, you know, its new industry. And they, and they sit around with a straight face around a table and they're talking about it. I was just thinking, what Ukraine are you talking about? Just the, what Ukraine in your mind, what are the borders of that Ukraine? What, what is the population of that country? Okay. I mean, it's almost, it, it's surreal. It's Kafka-esque. You know, they're planning the next 25 years of Ukraine. And I just, what are these, but that it falls in line with this, this messianic view that we've been talking about. Is it, it's inconceivable in their minds that they will not achieve their goals. 
and, and damn reality. That's what makes this very dangerous. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's really they see these countries like Ukraine um, as as and Russia as a whole. They they see Russia. They see all all Slavic people as as from a very um, racist lens. That they, they see all of these zones as just being slave colonies, just like what you know the the, the design for the original New World Order of the nineteen twenties thirties, especially um, led by Nazi fascist you know enforcers, which were still being bankrolled by the same city of London Bank of International Settlements you know, Wall Street industrialist uh, factions of, of, you know, Western fascists who we obviously history books don't tell it that way, but that's that's how it was. Um, that's how they saw Russia. That's what they that's what they loved in Trotsky, because tr that's why they worked so hard to get the Trotskyists to be, to go back into a, a dominant position so that they could go back to the 1920s perestroika under Armin Hammer of, you know, which was just basically new economic, new economy policy, liberalized uh, bring in the bring in the Western oligarchs, buy up the the land, and ultimately just service the minerals, the food, everything needed to just satisfy the capital, the some of the core zones. And people like you know immoral sociopaths like Trotsky, his his little handlers were were super happy going along with that design. And uh, you know th that's sort of that's why they, George Bush Senior called it Armin, uh, Operation Hammer. It was in honor of Armand Hammer in 1991. It's the same logic that was being applied to the the George. The George Soros perestroika age, you know, and that's what they want to go back to. They just love that. They it, hate the see, fact that it, that was. Yeah, that's, yeah. But that's premised on the on the fact that they would have uh, pliant um, servants for them. Okay, and yeah. and that's why that's why they looked upon the Yeltsin years um, so glowingly because he was a uh, he was duped and he was willing to go along with what they wanted. And so, but again, as George and I have talked about endlessly, is that it, at least in this epoch, you know, it's the, the Soviet Union slash Russia lost the Cold War. You are the, you lost, and that's why we, the victors, have a right to enforce our will upon you. And it, there's also a, a, a cultural element of it. Russia is a very conservative country, something that they can't uh, uh, comprehend. There's something wrong with conservative people, again, going to domestic politics also. Yeah. <laughs> My whole point is it's a very toxic brew that is all come together. Oh, yeah. But it's, it's interesting right. also that the, the Trotsky thing <laughs> is because, you know, it's no accident, as they say, that the Trotskyists became allies of the uh, the U.S. Cold War effort. I mean, that is, I mean, the CIA was very shrewdly bankrolled the Trotskyists as the most effective uh, tool domestically against uh, the Soviet Union, against the, you know, the influence of communism and influence uh, of uh, Soviet power. So the Trotskyists were really always at the forefront of the uh, the Cold War effort. Was, you know, and Trotsky himself had a baneful influence on American intellectual life. I mean, you know, via all the, all the James Burnham's and uh, Dwight McDonald's and so Albert, on. Albert Bolsetter and Albert Irving Bolsetter, Crystal exactly. and uh, what's his name? The Dewey, uh, John Dewey is, is John sort Dewey, of like yeah. one of his Sydney Hook, yeah. subtle yeah. protector handler. I mean, Dewey is a, plays an important role. I'm trying to figure out the full picture of this, but uh, but you had this whole network, and James Burnham is key in all of this. His personal assistant for all of, for the, throughout the 30s, uh, who then becomes the godfather of the neocons and Cold Warrior, and it's not inconsistent when you look at like Trotsky's philosophy of permanent war, permanent revolution, burn the earth in order to get some mystical bifurcation point in the future, at which point somehow a big transformation is going to happen. That's that's in that's embedded in the neocon view of burning the earth in order for them, you know, it became the the Protestant, you know, it became an absorption basket for a lot of the Protestant right wing um, nutters who were big into the rapture, who believed that it was their duty to bring in messianic. I already, I, already, I already said the word messianic. Okay, this is where it all comes together. It's messianic. Yeah, it's, 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 it's crusader. I mean, it's very much in conformity with the revival of the crusader spirit of uh, unifying everybody around a holy mission, which, uh, you know, ultimately it's it's designed, the Crusades were designed originally in the 11th century to be just that, a, a force of divide to conquer, chaos and destruction that one could manage from the top, the disorder, you know, um, in order to block the types of development and cooperation that were happening in the 8th, 9th, 10th century between China, the Abbasid dynasty, uh, the Carolingian empire, um, even frankly, when you look at even the, the interesting, I mean, uh, this is a very like 
there's a lot of opinion about Kazaria, but I mean, there really was this Jewish, uh, form, you know, uh, kingdom in the in the north that was part of the Steppe Silk Road between the Tang Dynasty and uh, and Charlemagne's empire, um, which also had a branch throughout the the south. So you had this all of these corridors that were run by the Jewish Radonite traders and managed in a, in a positive way to maintain a harmony of cultures was ant antithetical to the Samuel P. Huntington logic or the ultramontanist papacy's logic of that. No, one, one, every culture is, must be subdued under the, uh, the, the, this particular variation of, of Catholicism or whatever the hell that was more Satanism masquerading that they wanted to, and that's where the crusaders got their pathways was by taking over the the transit routes of the of the first or this the revival of the silk road that's where all the crusade for the first second third fourth crusade all moved along these these trade routes so it was like an, an early samuel p huntington clash of civilizations logic to again just destroy this ecumenical alliance which today is is manifesting in the form of the the, the new silk road and the spirit of internet inter-civilizational forces reviving this idea of win-win cooperation. There's something that we have to work with that makes us all human first and our ethnicity or, or religious groups secondary, but we're humans first against empire. That's, I mean, you know, it really is that. And the Trotskyites, yeah, they just, that that became the the incubator for this, uh, this, this insane- Well, well what it did was it, it gave, it gave a, um, a guiding core principle um, yeah. Um, to 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 unify around, okay, and to capture elites. I mean, we, when we look at um, uh, American foreign policy since the Second World War, there were distinct camps right now that that doesn't exist whatsoever. So there's been complete ideological capture uh, right now um, uh, when it comes to foreign policy, and it's it's messianic. And what what I find really interesting, Matt and George, is that it doesn't really want to build anything; it wants to block. And it wants to subdue. And I think that going back to the first part of our conversation, the um, the, the global South, the global majority, they don't the, they don't see how they're winners in that. That, that that's not a win win situation. The, the West has a win lose approach to everything, and it it does have its roots in in, 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 in to some extent in Christianity because. If you don't convert, then you're you're not worthy. Okay, and and we see this now with postmodernist ideas. Okay, it is it's it's taken a lot of the um, not the message but the mechanism uh, to enforce its will. And the problem is is that there's so many centers of power right now that have the power to resist. That's what I see with Ukraine. They don't see the West as their, their value system is valuable, meaningful uh, for them. And uh, actually, they have the resource, resources now to say no. That is that critical juncture that we have crossed into. They can say no. Mm, yeah, good point. Yeah, it's like they kept the worst elements of the, the fanatic rigidity. Um, yeah, and they, they left everything good <laughs> aside that used to be good about... That is good about Christianity, the the loving, the idea that uh, the truth is written on the on the hearts of all men. That's that's embedded in the in the. Well, you could even go as and that's all good. Agopic love, that's all forgotten, and just well, or we could, we could we could we can uh, uh, update it a little bit more. Um, the Enlightenment. I mean, the West mm -hmm. is turning its back on the Enlightenment, and I I would. I would wager that there are many parts in the um, the developing world that actually are attracted to some of those core ideas of the Enlightenment, and we see that being shut down in the West. Where yes, you can't even discuss science. I mean, you, 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 it's all settled. No, science is never settled ever. Okay, yeah. and and say so we 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 see this this very hegemonic uh, approach to all problems. And a lot of the problems are created by the West because of this ideology. And so, and I think that when, you know, the, the ideas of um, uh, uh, individual autonomy, freedom of speech, the rule of law, all of these things are, are, are under attack in the West for a higher cause. Don't ask me what it really is. And I think a lot of other people see the value in that. It doesn't mean you don't shed your cultural and religious values. They can, I think a lot of the ideas of the Enlightenment dovetail very well with you know conservative societies all around the world. It's not an either or choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, <clears throat> when, you, when you're in a situation of abundance and decadence, you have sort of the, the, the liberty to be very um, to be to be more relativistic about truth 
because it's like you know you're 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 we've been enjoying and reaping the harvests of the sacrifices and creations made by generations past i was born into a world that was already economically in a state of decline we stopped building infrastructure in canada like a, in a meaningful way back in the, the the 70s i was born in the 80s and uh and so that that system was already atrophying um, and so the, the orientation was, was towards the, the, the creation of bubbles, debt, you know, debt based bubbles, speculation, deregulation, we, we, that was already happening. And so where do I get my abundance from? Well, it was done by all of those efforts made by people who worked and built the great things that I enjoy, the, the agro industrial systems and other things. And, and so, we, you know, we, we turn into this lazy, useless services economy of people who were able to like, just have ideas di disassociated from practical reality. And so universities just became, you know, theoretical zones of masturbation where there, there was no connection between the economic theories the, that you were, you were teaching the students, you know, and, and actual real world life that, that you live in. It's not like that in, in China and Russia, as far as I could see that you have a much greater harmony or in, intensity towards seeing that there are real world applications um, of your economic ideas that have to be grounded in real concepts of value that if you're going to invest, you have to create, you can't just consume without building. You have to do both at the same time. And, um, I think this relativism thing is not something that, that Africa, it, most of the world who have not, who don't have abundance, they don't, they don't buy this relativism. It, it's, it's, it's all, nothing is true. There's no gender. There's no, they don't believe that they're, they're like, no, I need, I have, I'm going to have children that need food, that need a better life, that need water. I need, you know, we need, it, we need functional electricity. We, we see other countries doing it and we want that. They see that. So obviously the best ideas of the enlightenment that acknowledge the existence of truth are going to be receptive <laughs> and, and things of postmodernism that are, are just there for a decadent, you know, dumbed down society are not going to resonate with people who need to do things. And I hope that, you know, as, as demands for doing things, press themselves upon us as we begin to have to realize that we need either to go for a depopulation agenda and eat bugs, or we change, change things up and return back, restore old concepts of value we once had under John F. Kennedy. We're going to have to let go of certain postmodern concepts of science and, and art and other things too. But how does one so, do that? I mean, you've got this whole um, <clears throat> globalist, you know, the people who those guys who meet at Davos, and they are indeed wedded to the uh, the depopulation uh, agenda, uh, the whole uh, green agenda. And, you know, essentially they want their publics to live a much less prosperous life. I mean, you know, this this has been the, you know, the, the dream of these globalists for a long time, which is we need to uh, tamp down our expectation. We need to basically, you know, you know live, <laughs> li live much more austere lives. I mean, this has been the themes since the 1970s, ever since 70s. You know, the Club of Rome, and they say, no, 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 we've got to give up on this, give up on that, give up on that. So they, you know, they, they, this is their agenda. And then it's also the agenda of all the, the billionaires, the Bloombergs, the, the Gateses, uh, and so on. So how do we challenge that? What, what, while they get richer and richer, well, they they themselves exactly. They, they, yeah, they, right. That's, no, that's, that's always the case. You know that. Yeah, it doesn't doesn't apply to me. I mean, I, I will of course go on you know flying my uh, private jet, but uh, it's you 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 plebs who have to give up yeah, your yeah. Uh, your uh, washing machines. They don't believe the things that they're telling us. We have to take as high priorities. They don't believe that. They just they. See, that's the thing. They they they've crafted these stories, these narratives to. Uh, induce us into a state of a guilt a guilt complex victimized uh, victim complex society which is much more malleable like it's understood that to that creative love the flexibility of of positive rational hope is not very conducive in the the poisoned soil of the soul which is gripped by shame guilt uh, victimization all of these things it's just it's it's really useful for empire to have these as dominant cultural uh, forces keeping us in our little closed system boxes, afraid of ourselves, afraid of others, afraid of our neighbors, afraid of the future, shame to the past. It, 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 it atomizes us wonderfully and it makes us much more malleable. Think that that's what, what co I think that's what COVID was all about. Oh yeah. Yeah. Total shock therapy. Just to, yeah. Just to, just yeah. to shake it up and reset it. Um, 
Yeah, and but it's what, interesting. I mean, we, we're, we're kind of drawing upon uh, Western mythology, which is great with me. It's fine. It, it's kind of like, you know, um, hate the sin, uh, um, uh, hate the sin, but don't hate the sinner. See, well, these people are sinners, okay? And what they practice is sin, but we have to be guilty about committing sin because they're aware of what the sins are and they're somehow absolved because they are aware of our weaknesses and our needs for redemption. Right, but that's that's the way you exert mm. power. I mean, you exert power by uh, telling the masses who would challenge uh, your power that, hey, the fault is in you. You, you are wrong. You know, there's um, uh, Jeff Bezos, one of the richest men in the world, who gives money to Black Lives Matter to show, hey, I'm, I'm not a racist. You, however, my employees, you are racist. You, you, you know, in your everyday interactions, you're all racist. You know, you're all sexist. You're all misogynist. You're all homophobes. And I have yeah. to educate you. I have to, you know, make sure that the workplaces are, you know, woman friendly, yeah. gay friendly, whatever. So I, I, I am not only much richer than you, but I'm in the position of making you better people. Well, you know, you, you also look at. Uh... Jeff Bezos, he's got, he, he, I don't know how many hundreds, tens of millions of dollars he paid for this villa on uh, an island, which according to all of the, the, the climate models that, you know, he's supporting um, is going to be underwater in like 20 years, they say, but it's like he just spent all of this money and all of these guys are putting all of their, <laughs> their resources into these like buying islands that are going to supposedly be underwater. They don't believe in that and they don't believe in like they say nice things about harmony and climate in Africa, but it, it's like at this this uh, U.S. African summit, and I, I was I was bringing up uh, cobalt metals, which is founded by Bill Gates, funded by by Bezos, funded by 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 Branson, the New Space Movement people. This is this is an organization which says on their own website they intend to control all minerals of the world in like something like it's a it's a, it's a pipe dream mission statement, but that's what they want. And part of it was intimidating Angola, especially, well, especially Zambia and, and uh, the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, to sign on to programs that would loosen their regulation on labor, labor laws, child, uh, child laws, environmental protection, all of these things. They want them to take it all down as if it's not low enough already. There's 40,000 child laborers working in cobalt mines in, in Congo. They want that even, they want more kids in there. They want less environmental protection. I mean, they don't care about the so-called gospel that they're extolling up upon the rest of us that we're, are, we're just supposed to live like, you know, Greta Thunberg, poor girl. Like, that's what they want everybody is to feel that sense of radicalized victimization and self-hate and loathing because they that's, that's what they want as the new religion masquerading as a, a new pseudoscience or a new pseudo-Christianity. Well, but it, it seems to me that this is a way to legitimize a new serfdom. Because yes, the this is you know you you poor children digging for gold cobalt, but you will find redemption, you know, because you 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 you're, um, you've been victimized, and but we we at Davos we understand this, okay. And what it is, is is trying to inculcate into people that, you know, you have a certain station in life and it's your lot, okay? And, be, and the civilization that we're building, you will find redemption through our good works, okay? Look, FTX, okay, the San Bankman Freed type, it's that, that kind of mentality right there. Yeah. Now, and what I find really disturbing is that so many people buy into it is because the value system, and the West has no value system in it, at all. I mean, Netflix, porn, you know, um, uh, fentanyl, I mean, everything is an escape from the reality that these people have created for us, okay? Now, mm -hmm. I have to admit, if I had a 300-foot yacht <laughs> and a beautiful girlfriend and, a, you know, caviar, I probably would feel, oh, okay, I, I, I could live with my sins, if you know what I mean, okay? But the, but the West, no, no, well, the West does have a value system. I mean, it doesn't follow its own value system, but it does have the value system because it's worked out uh, what slogans, what buzzwords resonate with the public. I mean, it's a very, very skilled uh, propaganda exercise. I mean, when Stoltenberg um, uh, announces um, that, um, you know, we are not a party to the conflict uh, in Ukraine, uh, and, you know, we are, we are selling deadly weapons, not selling, we're sending uh, deadly weapons to Ukraine in order to bring peace that much closer, 
That, those are that's those are skilled propaganda points. That, that, that they don't just come spontaneously. These, these people have um, you know have learned from J D Bernays how you do propaganda and then rules based order. There are no rules and there's no order, but it sounds good. Oh yeah, yeah, rules based order. I, you know, I, I'm for that. No, they don't follow any of these things. But but those mm. are the, you know, the sort of the, well, or our, another our values. George is absolutely right. I, I saw um, uh, an interview with Norman Finkelstein, Aaron Maté did with him a few days ago. And I, George and I are going to try to get him on our podcast. And um, uh, Finkelstein uh, brought up a point that was really good. And I think it's uh, uh, applicable to our conversation here is that the whole Obama phenomenon is, is that it, it basically they framed it. They framed it. If you don't vote for him, you're a bad person. <laughs> okay, And, yeah. and it worked. It, it yeah. worked. <laughs> no, absolutely. Yeah, no, it did. Well, I mean, you, you've got this obvious uh, mush, mushification of the, the masses. Um, and, and again, like, just like we had indulgences back in the day, you know, you could pay for indulgences if you were a sinner, just give the church some money, they would give you a little piece, a get, a get out of hell free card. Um, sort of the same thing with carbon credits offset. If you've got the money, and you're a pollution sinner, you could pay some money into a green financial uh, boondoggle and get out a get out a green, you know, uh, hell free and still stay on the side of virtue. So you got these things. But I mean, for the most part, I think looking at Davos, a lot of the, the live streams of like the Davos conference um, only had people view views of like six, seven, eight thousand for most of the the uh, the live stream uh, panels and this is like supposedly the most important we're told most important uh, world shaping event you know every year and people as a whole I number one don't care to watch it um, it doesn't represent them number two they don't care about the people so the people actually managing this stuff you've got these different layers of mythology some for the masses to try to just keep the masses in a drunken state of Netflix and porn addiction and self mutilation as much as possible with horror movies and stuff. Which is a fact. Again, horror movies are effectively a, a form of spiritual self mutilation. You're just watching innocent people dying repeatedly, you know. And and eh. um, but but so you just got to keep them as confused as possible on psychedelics and whatever else, just escaping, escaping, escaping. And meanwhile, the target sort of managers, first, second, third, fourth, fifth tier managers, um, you have to keep them as ideological uh, as humanly possible and believing, you know certain drug myths that you create to give them a sense of purpose so that they themselves are instruments of a will that they don't fully understand. Okay, so you you're, know, talking you about, like, you're talking about Bolsheviks. Basically, modern, I, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, effectively. Yeah, they, what, they're one, detaching one example, Yeah, no, one yeah. example of that is that the other day, the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung in Germany published a poll of uh, what the Germans thought about Russia, Ukraine, and NATO. And according to this poll, only 45% of Germans are willing to help a Na if a NATO ally, a member of NATO is attacked. Only 45%, that's not even Ukraine, 45%, this Article 5, which is We're supposed all to in be this part, together. You know, oh, you know, that's it. One for all, all for one. 45%, you know, are willing yeah. to do that. Can you imagine just how fewer it is to do anything about Ukraine? And then, What's her name? Annalena Baerbock, the German foreign minister. I don't care what German people think. I will go on doing what I need yeah. to George, do for Ukraine. George, George yeah. that's not the first time they've done this poll. They've done it in the past. And I remember, I don't remember the exact numbers, but I remember that having, so essentially the same numbers, and they did it with um, Spain, uh, with Italy and other countries, and it was way less than 50%. Now, the reason why I interrupted you is that now we have the conflict in Ukraine and it's still 45%. So something very real, before it was theoretical, and now it's a very, a very real possibility and it still doesn't move the needle. That should tell us a lot. Yeah, good point. No, I, absolutely. And, and the fact that you've got Western, I mean, Biden has said we have to take the pain in order to save the Ukrainians. Now they're admitting all of a sudden that despite all of this this shame and guilt and we have to just you know toughen up uh look look at the poor ukrainians they're admitting that they're the ones who consciously self-sabotaged the minsk two agreements i mean people from bojo and and merkel and i mean it's now common knowledge it's almost like something you celebrate yourself and even zelensky himself has said we we all, we never intended to honor it 
And that was the whole reason why we demonized Russia to begin with is because- But Matt, but again, but the point here is that it, it, there's Johnson, he yeah. said, you know, it's on the record, Johnson goes to Kiev uh, and tells him, don't sign any agreement with Putin, because even if you agree with Putin, we're not going to uh, accept that agreement. And then we have Naftali Bennett saying the same thing. You know, Johnson was the one who basically pushed to, to squash it. And what, how do the media report it? You can't negotiate with Putin. Putin refuses. You know, we want peace, but it's Putin who, who, who rejects any possible agreement. I mean, it's on the record. And there were media yes, was still George, the opposite. That's the, the crux of the problem, gentlemen, is that the three of us and our viewers, they are informed. They have made an effort to understand the origins of this conflict. And it didn't start in February of last year goes much further back. But if we, we talked about Seymour Hersh's book, okay, he can lay out as much detail as he wants. But if the mainstream media and politicians don't, re I think Mike Lee was the only politician that made any kind of meaningful comment about it. But, you know, Mintz, we, you know, we're, we're obviously right. How many people in the public even know what we're talking about? When you look at reportage in the New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, CNN, MSNBC, how often do they bring that up? They don't even know what it is. And that's, that's why I, 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 I feel like, you know, we're just howling in the wind sometimes because it, it you know, yeah. it's not the issue of freedom of speech. It's the, the freedom of reach. And that's the yeah. problem. The reach is very, very limited to a group, a small group of people like ourselves. And that it's that is the biggest dilemma that we have. If we can't even make the case. There, I, I listen to uh, uh, NPR and, and stupid mainstream uh, radio when I'm, I'm stuck in traffic just to hear what the garbage is that the, that the zeitgeist is being uh, shaped by. And I mean, I listen to probably too much of this. Uh, anyway, um, <clears throat> you if you were just a regular normie, just in a in a passive, receptive consumer uh, relationship with the with information coming at you from these controlled zones, you would believe that Putin is the cause of global warming, and they they have experts that they trot out to make the case somehow scientifically that the war in Ukraine is driving climate change now, all because of Putin, or that Bashar al-Assad is the as is, is is at fault is the reason why there was an earthquake in Syria, um, and all this death. Uh, that, that that it's actually his fault and you know like people this is actually what you're you, you people can't accept being passive consumers of information now they will for a while still unfortunately the damage is, is quite deep but the the beauty of this this current situation in world history is that the 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 these oligarchs are masters of perception admittedly perception management five stars like they're great good job well done reality on the other hand not so good at their ivory tower. Um, it's an ivory tower system of controls. It all looks good on paper until you actually go into practice and then things blow up in your face. And then the Rome, the Western Roman empire collapses or, you know, it, 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 the, the oligarchy di didn't benefit with all of the effort and grand designs of how clean the new world order was going to look uh, under a fascist complex, you know, under the uh, Count Kunova Kalergi and his pan Europa, um, you know, which had Hjalmar shocked in the Mussolini networks and, and American fascists from the, C from the CFR. All of them were like working with this idea of, of pan Europa. That's at the heart of today's European Union, by the way. And, uh, and it looked all good on paper until they actually started doing it with the League of Nations. And then all of a sudden things started breaking. It didn't work that way. And Hitler all of a sudden didn't behave the way that he was expected to. And, and things started just falling apart. Even, and the oligarchs who were putting all of this effort and decades of work in, into doing it, all of a sudden had Frankenstein monsters that didn't really want to go along with the same plan, wanted to do their own thing. And it, didn't, it wasn't beneficial for the, the, the oligarchy has spent, has spent years, decades trying to undo or do it right this time, you know, play a, a longer game with a bit more patience since the 40s. And it's again, not working. You know, it looked good in the 90s. Now it's not, it, it, right. people, surprise, surprise, don't democratically want to just commit seppuku? on behalf of our, our you know uh, gods our new new 21st century gods that demand sacrifice they people don't want to do that what do we do it's like well 
maybe change. Well, I mean, thing. we, we got to get a, a good indication of that in 2016 with the election of Trump. OK, I mean, yeah. you know, the you know, you can feel whatever you want about the guy. It's fine with me. But I mean, and I've talked to discuss this with George. I mean, his his campaign slogan at the end of the day was, what do you have to lose? And I think that's where a lot of people are. <laughs> what do you have to lose? Right. Because well, everything else is gone. All right. Well, I, unfortunately, our time is up. That was a very good discussion. Great discussion. You know, time just whizzes by. So thank you so much, uh, Matt, for joining us. We're going to have you back very soon because, um, you know, that that wasn't enough. I mean, we just we only touched the surface. So hey, thank you. I, I was thinking, well, we could maybe do um, if we if we do this in the future, um, since the whole UFO psyop thing is is really amplifying. Um, <laughs> I, I wrote an article on on Lawrence Rockefeller, MK Ultra, psychedelics, and and uh, the UFO cult. Um, and um, there's like four, you know, stupid things that have all been like put forth that the U.S. has like dealt with the, these these UFO objects that they've shot down. One of them, anyway. All all of this is part of the crafting of new myths, new narratives, the great narratives for the 21st century to replace the old. You know, myths of Christianity and things. Well, that are not, I, I, yeah. not. well let's 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 do that next time. All right? Okay. <laughs> All, right. All right. Thanks very Take much, care, Matt. Guys. We'll see you. Okay, see you very soon.